Ladies and gentlemen, we're back for another unboxing. This one is a themed unboxing. We we'll do these once in a while just to put a theme together. Oftentimes, oftentimes on a daily basis, good stuff comes in. There's really no rhyme or reason to it. Sometimes we just want to theme it a bit, which will provide useful information, I feel like. And uh, the theme uh, that we came up with, I should say Marka came up with today, is sports watches on strap because most sports watches on strap tend to be in the undervalued column and what the potential future may hold and why. Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're getting into a transitional market, right? The whole sports watch craze has died down, although they are still the most popular genre of watch. And I think that a sports watch on a bracelet is a great watch, obviously very practical to wear on a day-to-day -day basis. But I think one undervalued segment is certainly that sports watch on a strap, be it leather or rubber, and that's what we're gonna feature Would today. Would you also agree if I said that when it comes to sports watches on straps specifically, they can always be that in-between of being serving as a dress watch, watch as well as a sports watch, yeah, right? a beach watch it's and like a suit a, watch. It's like a dress casual or like sport dress type of Because genre. more and more, it's, it's more, that in between. more and more we're seeing that genre sort of go right. away, right? Yeah. There's really the line There's between sports watch, uh, yeah. you know, people wear, you know, padded 5204s with a sweatsuit. Like a oyster flex Daytona with a, with a exactly. suit, you know so, what I mean? No, so no the no selections you actually came up with, it wasn't me. You were the one that went down to the safe and brought these up. I mean, a lot of these are recent comers, but uh, let's go to a Panerai. Yeah, Panerai being, I think, a watch that uh, definitely had a fall from grace from the 2000s, right? When Panerai and the Panerai oh former oh my God. Uh, really popped off. And that's when I would say it was Panerai's heyday. But I think these new submersible models really helped elevate Panerai's line. There's something a little bit new and fresh, very evocative of their old tool watches they used to make for the Italian Navy, but modernized very much. This is a PAM 973, and I personally really, really love the look of this. You're preaching to the choir because I was there in the heydays of Panerai when pretty much every Panerai was selling over list and, and they were off to a great start when they did that. In fact, it was one of those things, very often when you see a group take over a brand, out of the gate, they don't do well. Yeah. Look at Daniel Roth. Sure. Uh, look at uh, Gerald Genta, Gerald Genta yeah. right? Absolutely. It's at a later time where the brand starts to pick up steam when they do certain things. Panerai was one of those brands that came out of the gate really, really hard. Right. And by that is because every single watch that was made by Panerai was a limited edition of something, right? Mm -hmm. So first few years, it was limited edition, limited. And then that kind of lost its appeal and somewhere in between they forgot to do something else in order to keep the appeal going, right? And also not to mention, Panerai was very clever in the use, I mean, inadvertently, the use of ambassadors at the time, right? We talked about Audemars Piguet in the way that they used the likes of Arnold and Jay-Z and, and figures like that, but Panerai had Arnold, Arnold and also uh, Sylvester Stallone, right? Who at the time, I think, were two of the biggest actors in the world. Uh, certainly very, very prominent figures who helped elevate and raise the the Panerai they also did. They also did a lot of cool stuff with adventure types. The submersible is actually one of my favorites because it encompasses what's, what Panerai was always all about. They're about that submersible watch, about the depth and things of that nature. Obviously, the Marina line, the Radio Mirror line, I love those all the time. But the submersible was sort of the Submariner for uh, what the Submariner was for Rolex. Yep. And they did it in a lot of variations. The first Submariner was the PAM 24. Don't ask me how I remember that. Of course, you had the La Bamba, the PAM, PAM 87, which was the slightly thicker one yeah. with the blue dial. That was a super that popular nice. watch. And they did the variations there off like limited editions. Again, the brand in itself sort of fell off. It was the same thing over and over. You know, 08 really did them in, right? And that hype was over because they yeah. were trading at some ridiculous numbers over this. But they're still here. They're still under Richemont umbrella, which means they're not going anywhere anytime soon. And I today, they're, the they're, they're all vibes. under list and the secondary way pre on their list. Yeah. Under list. Yeah. I mean, you're also starting to see a lot more of a revival, right? Panerai used to just be like that good summer vacation watch that you bought, you know, like kind of in May and then you sold it off in September. But yeah. they're, they're starting to stay in people's collection longer and longer. And you know what? I'm all for it. There's still a lot of Panaristis out there left. I'm going to yep. I'm going to jump up on price real quick just because this happens to be in this case. Um, Dibithium. Now, not just any Dibithium. Why did you pick this one? Uh, just because it's so sick. <laughs> it's a, you, this is a DB27 uh, JPS John Player Special, uh, named after obviously the racing team because of the black and gold colors. Um, this obviously being Dibithune's uh, one of the first sports watches, not the first sports watch, but 
waterproof. It has that whole uh, LED display on the actual dial. I think it's such a cool look and obviously that floating look system. I hope, I hope system this watch is wound so we can actually show. It isn't, no. It isn't. We need to wind it to show you how this thing actually lights up and there's no battery inside. Yeah. How do they achieve that? Um, I don't, I honestly, I don't know. It, it's, it's a good question. I probably should look into it, but it's all mechanically, mechanically Right, I mean, it's using, it's obviously it's, it's using the power of the mainspring to power a Correct. little light bulb. Yes. It's just that I don't know of any other watch that has ever done that. People already have gotten used to take for granted things like perpetual calendars, chronographs, uh, world time complications and things like that. Mm -hmm. And this kind of flew under the radar as well, because you literally have a watch that lights up and it's the mechanics that make it light up. It's underappreciated, maybe not undervalued, but certainly because underappreciated. Because they're, they're, they're trading at list. Yes, so, so the, I think the mechanics of it, you know, first of all, obviously the, the technology inherent in the watch, right? The proprietary shock absorbance system, balance wheel, escapement, all this stuff is all proprietary watchmaking to De Bethune, which has, uh, I mean, so many patents, uh, Denis Flagellet being a genius of watchmaking. And then not to mention, I think the actual look of the watch is just so good. Like you you compare this price point, this versus an LM Perpetual, but something like this is a lot more user-friendly, a lot more wearable. You can actually take this to the beach with you if you really wanted to. And the black and gold look is just, it, it's awesome. So I'm not gonna say undervalued, I'm gonna say underappreciated. Underappreciated. Here's, sure. here's one where I feel that there's always been an undervalue, and that is Rolex on straps. I'm gonna go back as far as even around the time I was starting, you looked at Daytona's on straps. They were dogs. Right. A gold Daytona on strap, you could pick up in the low teens, sometimes for 10 grand. I've seen them even under for some of the older ones. Again, we're going back sometime, yeah. right? Uh, even things like, the, uh, even those Daytonas that had the meteorite dial, that had some of the funky dials, yeah, some other absolutely. pearl diamond dials. Although, even the beach Daytonas, there all those so things. light Daytonas, all those, yeah. The minute they, you took a Daytona and you put on a strap, and this is way before this time, way before the hype and any of that stuff, People were just like, no, a Daytona should be on a bracelet. And slowly but surely, we finally walked into an arena where Rolexes on straps are becoming a thing. And what started it was actually this watch. It was actually the Sky Dweller that started the watch, that started the craze, the ones that came on a leather strap. And I'm not talking about the current ones that are on an Oyster Flex, I'm mm -hmm. talking about these guys. And I remember very clearly, this is way before a client of mine calls me and he says, listen, I'm being offered the Sky Dweller, they're giving me 10% off. At the time, I told him, I said, listen, I could probably get you 15% off. He's like, oh, I'm here on the island, I'm just gonna buy it, right? Yeah. And he ended up buying it. At the time, the list on the gold, I'm gonna say 24, 27,000, somewhere around there, he got 10% off. He got, it, he got it in the low 20s, right? And again, this came out, it was still frowned upon, but what helped was this was a new model. Right. So now we have a Sky Dweller, the most complicated mate watch, et cetera, et cetera. We fast forward to today, now we go to Oyster Flex, which changed the game completely. Now you have the Pikachu, where the, the, uh, the Taiwan, Taiwanese pop yeah. star. Uh, he wore it, it, it When he wore crazy. it, it, it made it go through the roof. All the other Oyster Flex models follow to include things like the Yacht Master, which is what we have here. But yet, since the adjustment of the market, obviously the first things that went down were the least, the less popular, because these are still less popular than regular pieces. But the, the value is where? This is under retail. That's under retail. This is under retail, yeah. which by the way, quick take, my favorite, literally my favorite combination of a Yacht Master on the Oyster yeah, Flex. It's Yellow awesome. gold, black bezel, it makes a statement, it's not too gaudy, it's not too loud. Absolutely. In the likes of, let's say, the, even the Sky Dweller, comfort level is there. Yep, they, both super wearable, both really, really, like bigger watches for Rolex, but not overbearing on the wrist. Uh, so you get a big gold watch, you get the look. And again, very versatile watches, right? Something like this on a strap, you can put it on a rubber beat, for example, if you really wanted to dress it down. Something like this on an Oyster Flex, dress it up, dress it down so easily. I, I, I mean, I just love The amount of guys I've seen both. wearing Daytonas, Yacht Masters, Sky Dwellers, all on the Oyster Flex band with a suit is just yeah. insane. And, and yet just, you can take the suit off and go to the beach. Yeah. It looks absolutely amazing. So you think that, so the value here, or the undervalue here is that there are trading, that you can, on the secondary, they get picked up at a discount. Well, not just that, right? You you compare something like this, the rose gold chocolate dial on an Oyster Flex strap, right? You're gonna be paying still over, over list for that watch. And why? Just because of that rubber strap, there's no real change to the movement. Okay, this has the, the Arabic dial, which I actually like over the, the regular indices a lot so more. So this legible. is because of the leather strap, the previous version. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That, that's that's really the only only calling card that makes this less popular than, for example, the Oyster Flex model. And the Yacht Master has just always been very undervalued. I, I just feel as a line, you can go back it's, to the Platinum yeah, Yacht Master, the, platinum, the Blue, the Gray, yeah, they're, you go back to, always, to these. They've yeah. always been undervalued. No doubt. Okay, fair enough. Uh, let's switch gears a little bit. Let me go to an Omega. 
Yeah, Omega yeah. Seamaster. Obviously, that's the, the James Bond watch known in so many different variations. The H-Link style bracelet being so iconic for the Seamaster. But I really like this model in particular because it's just such a clean format, right? That all black uh, stealth, no date, which I really, really like. I wish they did it in like 40 or 42 millimeters, no date. Uh, but this one comes in, I think, at 43 and a half millimeters, so a touch bigger. And it's an all ceramic too. Great, great value proposition sits well, on the sits well on the wrist. I mean, I have a, I have a fairly small wrist. And yep. this, this sits perfect. I mean, the rubber strap works for it. So, I mean, look, if you look at, let's look at uh, Speedmaster versus Seamaster. It's always been that, right? Yeah. It's always been sort of always, like, yeah. sort of that notch or step below. And people, when they think Omega, they think Speedmaster first and foremost, much like when you think Rolex, you, you think Samaritan, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think the difference here is, let's say, that of a Samariner versus a 41 millimeter they just Right. Or, uh, yeah, that's really it. It's that's exactly really, it. It's yeah. exactly it. It's like, it's there, you have the flex, you have the name, you have the look. Exactly. But it's not quite it. It's not. You know, you'd probably prefer Samariner because I feel like the Samariner is a slightly bigger flex, a, lot, a little bit more recognizable. Yeah. Uh, or, just you, like a or you can do like the GMT Master 2 versus the Explorer 2. I think that's also an that's also a pretty. That's yeah. also a pretty good yeah. comparison. And again, does it make one watch worse than the other just know and i said tell people the different. same thing buy what you like first and more it's the speedy that you want and if you're looking for that ultimate flex where people will definitely recognize that's an omega on your wrist then right. sure but this is just as recognizable and with a seamaster line often you will save i would say to the tune of 10 to 20 percent versus the uh, the speedy right somewhere around there yeah well, i would say closer to 20 yeah closer to 20. yeah because well, Speedmaster, the, yeah the, the james bond ones are still selling right those games. are those are still selling very very and i know why you picked this because you know what there's no need to explain to people zenith no. most people out there till this day or maybe my generation people will think of a vcr when they think zenith <laughs> right unfortunately because it's just it is what it is Sure. It's funny how branding is embedded inside our heads. I still remember jingles from commercials from 25 years ago when I was watching Saturday morning cartoons, well, probably longer than 25 years ago, but irrelevant, uh, right? So you still remember those jingles. And, and again, branding is so strong, especially in the US market that people look at a Zenith and they think of VCRs right away. They think it's somehow a brand that's lower class than let's say it's, it's other brothers and sisters within the group, right? Sure. It, but it's not. Zenith is so iconic. Let's talk about El Primero, one yeah. of the most iconic chronographs, if the, not the iconic chronograph in the world. The first, I'll call it the first Swiss automatic uh, chronograph used in so many different watches across the ranges. Bulgari, obviously famously in the Rolex Daytona. You know, one of the most historic and important movements ever made, one that was almost lost, right? The whole attic story with Charles Vermont and his brother who uh, hid all the, the designs and the- What the, if they did hide, imagine? I, how it would, history would change. You know what? It would be completely, right? Because the idea is that that entire watchmaking, uh, like, what's it called savoir faire we say in french like uh the, yeah, the what knowledge he, what, what he said the, the knowledge the knowledge right was would have been completely lost and and that's that's a big issue right you look at the whole idea and conception things aren't made how they used to be right mm -hmm. and that that's exactly why the yeah, so think, think of if brigade's uh you know turbion yeah. plans were lost forever. absolutely you know what i mean absolutely like, yeah so so i mean listen historic chronograph i love what they're doing with the new el primero lines uh, and this, the one one hundredth of a second, I think is awesome to interact with, play with. And it's also just a good, good looking watch, right? This all so, black so, skeleton so this, watch. So this line in ceramic, uh, chrono, non-chrono, white, black, everything about them aesthetically, if you look at a skin, well, how much is a street for? This is under $10,000. So under $10,000, you're getting a iconic chrono, the most iconic chronograph ever made. You're getting a ceramic case, you're getting a skeleton. It's a lot of bang for your dollar. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And, and if, what, if what you're looking for is Good horology, a great horology. If you're looking for aesthetics, just everything around it is just it just works. And yep. again, it goes back to what price range are you what price range are you playing with? Uh, and again, you buy this in a secondary, get rid of the hit up front. You don't walk into it, but you can pay retail right. for this or this or this. So far, would you say that? Well, yeah. this you can, uh, this you this you can this you can on an Oyster Flex, right? Right, but. For the most part, you know, anything that's to the left here, it's not something you come into the boutique and pay full list for. You take, get rid of the hit up front, buy it on the secondary and enjoy it because that's a gorgeous white. That and white, to me, with the white rubber strap for, awesome. for summertime, the white like I will, I, awesome. I can flex any watch I, even, I want. I will put that watch on it. I, I was in Switzerland recently. They released a full black ceramic one uh, with the skeleton dial and I got to see that for the first time and it was spectacular. I think it's the best non-black ceramic Royal Oak watch you can get, right? Like hmm. I get the comparisons, but it's it's a distinct design. 
all ceramic. It's a great looking I model. think Zenith is here to stay. They've been around yeah. for a long time and they're gonna be around for a long time. Again, they're under the right group, a group that has money, marketing, and, and good, uh, I guess factories also say the ability to continue making all this stuff, the yep. logistics in place to continue innovating the way that they're doing. This is a bit of a surprise for yeah, me. Yeah, this is not undervalued, it's just underappreciated. Because <laughs> I mean, it's certainly over retail, right? It's not no, but, but, hold, but hold on. Think about what you get with a 5980. First of all, it's discontinued. Let's start there. Correct. Right, which is, yep. for those that own this, is great news. Yeah, right? great, great but, news. And I'm glad because they've been making it for long enough. I want to see how you're going to tie value. Now, this originally retailed for. I want to say around 70, 60, 68, something like that. Some, something around. Let's that. say around 70 grand, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's funny how retails have become so irrelevant in the last yeah. three years. I used to know every single retail off the top of my head, but now they're irrelevant, so you don't retain that information. So retail is around 70, trades for? Uh, it trades for, I want to say, now that it's discontinued, probably closer to 120, maybe even more penny year in condition. Okay, and then now we look at the same watch, but on a bracelet, I mean, retail is around $90,000. Yeah, for something brand, brand new, like a new buckle, you're going to pay over 220000 So, So I can see where you can tie the value there. Yeah, absolutely. If you look at... Essentially, it's like a $10,000 bracelet, you know, worth of gold itself. You know, maybe like add another 10 for like... There's the, no $10,000 in gold in there, but whatever it is. <laughs> but whatever it is, but you're paying... A Essentially, like a hundred thousand less for this watch, right? So, so that's 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 really the idea. But I just I always like the fifty nine eighty on a strap because of this contrasting sub dial over, uh, for example, the fifty nine eighty in Rosewood. I don't know why it's just that little touch uh, that I felt really so you set off the watch. Because you happen to like the watch. Yeah, I happen to like the watch, and <laughs> I, I just think, listen, it's if you think about the lineup of the Nautilus, right? This was actually Patek's first in-house chronograph movement. Fifty nine eighty was released in two thousand and I want to say two thousand six or two thousand eight, and then the fifty seven. No. Fifty one seven. 5980 was released like in 2003. No, 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 it was not. It was 2006 or 2008. It couldn't then, have been eight because they crashed in price in 08 and I was there. Okay, so then it would have been, been 2006. I was, I'm going to say, first, I'm say the first four. I'm going to say four. I'm, you know what? I'm pretty sure because then two years later, the 5170 came out and that was the first in-house manual. I have, this, I have this friend I like to call up on. His name is Google. <laughs> I'm, 2006. What can I say? Yeah. So I two, thought it was four. I thought I, it was Because I always get confused with 2006, because 2000, 2008 was the 5170. That was right. the first in-house right, manual right, right, chronograph. Right, right. That was the base that they used also for the perpetuals of the 270. Uh, I do love winning. Look, look how exciting you guys. Uh, this right here, historic watch, I, I, or historic movement rather, and I just love the look of it. So if you go back to when these things were released again, uh, again in the mid 2000s, right? Uh, uh, 5711 on a straps, yellow gold, white gold, dogs. Mm -hmm. 5980, rose but gold. But 5711J was ugly. Like, that's an ugly watch. Like, a yellow gold actually, with a actually, white. Actually kind of like no, that's but whatever. Another, whatever. But whatever, it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. So, the 5711s on straps were dogs yeah. in precious metal. The 5980s on a strap were like second best. The 5980 on a strap was the difference between a Seamaster and a Speeder. It's Speedmaster. It's yeah. literally what it was, mm -hmm. as we discussed earlier. But you know, as the markets go up, you know, it lifts up the rest of the models, right? Sure. The ones that are less popular. But the fact that this is now discontinued, I think, again, for those that have it, I think it's a great watch. Personally, I've seen these put on a white rubber strap, an aftermarket oh, white rubber strap. Yeah. They look amazing. Yeah. And Even again, orange looks that's nice. out of everything that we've seen here so far, what, to go back to what I said initially, Wearing a sports watch with a suit, this would be my number one choice. Yeah, this, this is such a great looking watch. I'm a huge fan of it. I remember uh, when I first came across, I was watching a uh, Watch Eric video because he used to own it like in his personal mm -hmm. collection. Then he ended up selling it. I was like, that was, I was like, why would you sell it? Like, it was so nice, but uh, you can't keep everything. You Listen, know? I remember buying. This is good years ago. I remember buying these watches in the 40s. So yeah, yeah. Don't 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 yeah, talk to me about it. Anyway, uh, last but not least, you really brought the granddaddy, and that is the Grand Complication Audemars Piguet. And there's a lot of things I can say about this as to why this watch is particularly in the value, but I'm here, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Now, mind you, this isn't just a grand comp, and this grand complication entails a full-blown perpetual calendar, a not a, just a chronograph, but a split-second chronograph and a mirror repeater. And this is a piece unique. This is one made, it's called the Pride of Argentina, so it's one of one. Coloring is amazing, the watch yeah. is amazing. Your take as to why this is under Yeah, so I think this was made for, uh, it was the bicentennial, the 125th anniversary of like the founding of Argentina. Uh, this also has a hunter case back, which I always like. It's like that throwback to officer style watches. But this was the most complicated watch Audemars Piguet made until 
last year when they released the Code 1159 uh, Ultra Complication, right? So we're talking about a piece of history from AP. I remember uh, Houdinki released a video uh, with Francois, who's now the former CEO of AP. And he said, you know, we used to sell watches back in the day. We used to pop a bottle of champagne, right? Because that's just AP wasn't popular. And this, they would probably go out for steak and caviar. Just on this one, <laughs> I, mean, I just want to show off the Hunter case back. I mean, this, this is just, up. it's a spectacular and Let's not underplay the fact this is also an automatic. Yeah. And you know, a lot of the grand right. comps out there are not. You right, know, they're manual. Having right. this as an automatic and, and again, the Hunter case back, everything about it is just... Look, it was well, very well thought out. But right. why did you pick this as an under? Sure, I mean, watch? this is a watch that was selling at retail for one point two million dollars. No, it's one million seventy eight thousand Swiss francs. Okay, it is one point two million dollars. You're right. Right. In so, dollars. so one point two million, and and now on the secondary market, you're picking up for less than half of that. Right, mm -hmm. way less than half of that. Even I think this is trading for right under five hundred thousand. We're asking for it. So, I mean, you're getting a piece unique, one of one, historical complication, historical watch for AP. And you're, you're just not going to find another. And it's at a fraction of what it was originally selling. The, for. the question is always going to be asked to why the number one answer. Usually this is a very big watch. Yeah. Not like if you look at if you look at this yeah. watch on my wrist as much as this, this I would still wear it, but it just doesn't look yeah. right. So you do need a wrist for this particular watch. You also it also takes an individual that understands why this watch was really originally a million bucks plus, right? Of how complicated it is, how much heritage is in this watch considering the heritage of Audemars Piguet that started out of the gate making complicated movements, notably most for Tiffany pocket watches, if you remember. And when you're looking at a piece like this, you have to appreciate the horology first and foremost. You have to have the ability to wear the watch because it is quite a large watch and measures in the 45 millimeters. They've understood why they made it a Royal Oak. The officers were 44 at the time. They made this yeah. a 45 millimeter, much like the Terbion Chronos and things. And yet they classified them as a Royal Oak because I guess on the Royal Oak Terb, it was a slightly thinner profile, but this very well will compete in size with any offshore, but they decided to keep it within the Royal Oak line. And last but not least, you know, people always ask me about uh, expensive pieces, six figure pieces, right? A hundred thousand and up, let's call it, right? You know, across all these major brands, the minute you get up in retail price, the minute you get up there in that price tag, you know, you tend to get better deals. You tend to get the watches discounted, right? right? Versus just a plain old chrono from Paddock that sells over list still, right? And my answer is always simple. It said, first and foremost, that how many people do you know personally that can afford six figure watches freely? Because, and I'm not talking about somebody who's gonna, and I don't condone this, go out there and take $100,000 out of savings which is probably, you know, makes up half of his net worth and decides to buy that watch. No, that's not. I'm talking about somebody that can freely spend a hundred grand plus on a watch the same way me and you would go buy Chipotle, right? Right. So how many of those people do you know? And the guy would probably say, well, probably not all the people that I hang out with, but a few. I said, now take those few people and ask yourself a question. How many of those few people that can't afford those products are actually willing to spend the money on that product? Well, not just willing, how many are watch collectors? How many? Well, that's right, but by, will, by willing, I mean right. that because some right. of those guys may, I know guys that will spend 150 grand on a bottle of wine yeah. versus a watch anytime and wear a Timex, right? It's not for everyone. And I said, so what does that do? That creates, you know, a much shorter demand, right? right? And you're not, not even mentioning what the demand the may be there, but the what, ability to buy what's actually the buy. competition, right? You're talking about a $500,000 watch. What, you know, there's, what else there's can so you buy for the money, right? right exactly. But then I say this, I say, even though the companies that produce or have the ability to produce these type of watches, AP is one of very few. There's not a whole lot of companies out there that can even produce that. Let's start there. But even though the company does their best to produce within what they think the demand may be for those pieces, I mean, even in a regular production, they produce maybe four a year, maybe five a year at best, right? Okay. Maybe three. Yeah. Right? If they're still the secondary markets, when they come out back on the secondary market, now you're competing with the newer stuff that's coming out. For example, the Code 1159 Grand Complication, which was probably the best watch they've done, done yeah. yet in the Grand Complication round. And they've also done a lot of variations with this specific movement, right? We've seen the, the Peace Unique Rose Gold uh, Skeleton, uh, also the Stainless Steel and Skeleton. They did a white ceramic, a black ceramic Skeleton. So they, they made a ton of variations of these. Exactly. Which also does exactly. So, now, so now you're taking what, and the company, the company knows their demand on these pieces to a T because they have literally a list of clients that right. they will produce these watches then they know these clients will they know pick exactly up. What they're they know selling. exactly who they're selling to at the moment probably up to 90 percent i would but say before they even make the watch exactly yeah. but now you take all the watches that they're currently making and now whatever's out on the secondary market and that increases availability versus probably the same demand mm -hmm. right i mean there's a little bit of demand on the secondary for these a lot of people go out there and buy these on the secondaries because they are a deal but this is really in a nutshell what happens so it's the size 
It's obviously the price point that you're playing with. What are your options within those price points, right? Because this $500,000, you can park this in, in a lot of places. Many, yeah, and at the end of the day, it's you also- buy all the watches on the table. And at the, end, and at the end of the day, there, there are guys out there that will plot that $500,000 on a Rashad Neal, which is a flex aesthetically from the outside and nowhere near as complicated as this versus somebody that will plot that same money into horology, right? And that's the difference. This is a horological flex, even though it's still a Royal Oak, but this is a horological flex first and foremost, yeah. right? Guys that want to flex with a Royal Oak, they'll probably go with the new Travis Scott watch or the Black Panther before they go with this. But again, it's for those that want to flex horologically, but they have to have the pocket and they have to have the size of a wrist in order to be able to support that. Yep. I think that about does it for us. Very nice mix. Uh, I like I, it. I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm Good very, range of I'm, price I'm, points, I'm, brands. I'm very, you, like you, you, went, you went from, you know, a Panerai and an Omega Seamaster to a Grand Complication AP for a million dollars. Very interesting range. Next time, give me a heads up. <laughs> Marco, thank you so much for joining me. I think this was a great selection that you came up with. Let us know in the comments if you want to see more of these steam unboxings versus the ones that we just don't even know what's in the box. And uh, like, comment, share, subscribe. We'll see you in the next one.